Okay, so good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second edition of DIPSCO's Reproducibility. My name is Vivian Grillo, and I'm honored to host this event and present the fourth and last seminar, Plagiarism in the Age of GPT-3, actually GPT-4, with my colleague and dear friend, Miren. So as by now, you all know, we're here to discuss the paradigm shift towards open science, transparency, collaboration, and accessibility in science, which is also the mission of DIPSCO, so the Department of Psychology and Cognitive Sciences here at the University of Trento. And as we've been said, my name is Mirren Shenver, and I want to thank you all for joining us today. So as many of you know, and we've said before, we are the first Italian journal club within the Reproducibility Network. We're focused on the promotion of open science. And this local initiative within a global community is dedicated to fostering discussions on topics related to open science and questionable research practices, older new methodologies, and representation in science. That's right, Mia, and, and we're pleased to announce that our weekly seminars are open to everyone, including students, researchers, and the general public. The seminars will consist of a, or this seminar will consist of a 20-minute pre uh, presentation, followed by a 30-minute interactive discussion. So funnily enough, the author began his article with a disclaimer, telling readers that he didn't use GPT to write his paper. So we thought that before we begin, Vivian and I will also disclaim that apart from a practical example, we did not use GPT-4 to help us write our presentation. So let's dive into this paper together. Uh, we care to preface that the article was published in March of 2021. Therefore, we took it upon ourselves to research and integrate more and updated information uh, extending up to the present time, being the computer science field and constantly is constantly evolving. Uh, consequently, our presentation is a combination of the article and of the resources we studied to provide you with a more exhaustive general picture of what is happening in the IT world and the implications that may arise or have already arisen as Miren will um, share shortly. So as you might have noticed, we kept an abbreviation in the title of our presentation today. For who hasn't read today's article or read the worrisome blogs and news or use ChatGPT, GPT-3 might not say much, or maybe it might sound like the name of a transformer, GPT-3, Bumblebee. <laughs> so what does GPT stand for and what is it? Ironically enough, GPT is a transformer, not the vehicle transforming movie character type, but a generative pre-trained transformer, which is a type of language model that uses deep learning to generate human-like conversational text. So I realize that uh, this definition is packed of unusual terms for some. So let's take a step back and understand what we're actually talking about from a technical standpoint. So on this slide, you can see on the screen, I created a diagram to guide us today into the field of computer science and specifically the branch of AI. AI stands for artificial intelligence, and it refers to the theory and development of computer systems that are capable of imitating and tackling tasks that usually require human intelligence. It is common to refer to, refer to AI as weak or narrow, when we describe an AI system that is trained by data scientists on a specific singular or limited task. In other words, it excels at solving a precise type of problem, and this is today's AI. On the other hand, we have strong AI, also known as artificial general intelligence, or AGI, as I wrote on the screen, which is the supposed AI of the future. So if possible, some say it could be expected by as early as the year 2040. This AI is thought as being self-aware and uh, capable of carrying out any task thanks to reason and self-learning. And just to give you an idea, if you can picture it or if you want to imagine it, you can think of the Terminator. So when we look at AI subsets, we can find NLP, or Natural Language Processing, which takes into account Chomsky's, Chomsky's work from the uh, 50s and 60s on formal grammar, 
And this is where he investigated mathematical and computational aspects of, gram of grammar. So natural language processing software today is pervasive. In fact, GPT-3 and others rely on this AI. And with the advent of deep learning, which is a specialized subset of machine learning, which in turn is a subset of artificial intelligence, as you can see in the diagram, sophistication and generalism of NLP or natural language processing models have been flourishing. But why? Because deep learning in GPT-3 has 175 billion parameters. So GPT-3 is an important breakthrough because of the amount of parameters used, which was unheard of before. And we are talking about a $12 million worth system. Unfortunately, OpenAI itself, so the Silicon Valley AI-focused research firm that created GPT-3, realized potential harmful uses of such a powerful system like GPT-3. These use cases included generating and disseminating misinformation, spam, uh, phishing activities, abuse of legal and governmental processes, fraudulent academic essay writing, social engineering pretexting, and the list goes on. So yes, GPT-3 was an important but concerning milestone. And why is that? Because it could do so much. It could write original computer code, it could retrieve and structure data, it could generate financial statements and so much more. And just by being prompted in natural language. And what is natural language? It's our language, it's human language. So in our field, in research and academia in general, GPT-3 is thought to facilitate academic misconduct and plagiarism. But Mirren will tell us more about this soon. Just to be clear, as you can see on the screen, ChatGPT has been evolving over time. We can say that ChatGPT's story starts in 2018 with a paper on generative pre-training of a transformer-based language model written by Alec Radford and his colleagues that was published on OpenAI's website on June 11th of 2018. Knowing these details are not necessary to understand the paper, but we cared to highlight that the article we're presenting today took into consideration and used GPT-3 version, which is so different from the 3.5 version or today's GPT-4 version. In fact, the last version, GPT-4, is OpenAI's most advanced system. So just to share four confirmed differences or improvements, even just between the 3.5 3.5 and the 4 version, we have longer answers. So ChatGPT is more verbose. It can read, analyze, generate up to 25,000 words of text. It can provide more relevant answers. So for instance, understanding user intent or uh, humor, and it provides safer answers. So ChatGPT has been optimized to reduce the invented um, content. And the fourth point we found is a multimodal model, which means that it can take images as well as text as input. And this gives it the ability to describe the humor in unusual images or summarize screenshot text um, and answer exam questions that contain diagrams, which can be pretty tricky. All right, so now that we understand better GPT and how it fits into the world of AI, we will jump into the literature review of the paper. So I want to say that we could spend days discussing the ethical implications of AI, but today I'm just gonna briefly talk about the ones that were mentioned in the article and with a particular focus on GPT and of course threats to open science, which is why we're, we're gathered here today. So the author mentions that ethical debates on strong AI, which Vivian talked about a little bit, um, focus on morality issues. So that are issues that arise as AI becomes more and more human. For example, what sort of human attributes are moral for strong AI to take on? So if anyone's seen the movie Her, think about that. Uh, ethical discussions on weak AI are numerous. There's a ton of them. So there are concerns about AI replacing humans in the workplace, which in my field, work psychology, is a, a big topic right now. 
There's also concerns over the ability of humans and robots to effectively interact, especially in the workplace. Uh, additionally, as humans are the ones designing AI, there are also questions about bias that may be ingrained in AI influence AI outputs. And then lastly, there is a question of who is responsible for when something goes wrong with AI use. So again, another example, think about who's responsible when a self-driving car crashes. So as the author moves on to more GPT specific ethics, we start to see how AI can pose a threat to open science. So with AI generated text, we now have questions about intellectual property and who does this intellectual property belong to? So is it considered plagiarism to use AI generated text? In this way, GPT really poses a threat to transparency in academic writing, all the way to the point where certain plagiarism detecting platforms, and maybe Jennifer uses this at Duke University, I know it was used uh, throughout my college experience, but it is turnitin.com, and it's a platform used to detect plagiarism, and now they have just integrated uh, and adopted AI in order to detect AI generated text. So we will touch upon these aspects more deeply further into the presentation. So let's jump into the author's experimental design. So in order to investigate whether GPT can comprehend prompts, generate convincing and unique content, and pass plagiarism detection, the author prompted GPT-3 AI Dungeon and analyzed the output text. So just really quickly, GPT-3 AI Dungeon was an online service which integrated a generative pre-trained transformer that allowed users to have a text-based adventure through AI. And this was done by the user prompting the GPT service with instructions for text output, followed by the GPT service using natural language processing to produce an output. So just like chat GPT, if you've used it. But since the author's experiment in March of 2021, AI Dungeon has been replaced by a competing model after OpenAI changed their policy regarding generated content. So it really brings to light, again, the point that this is an ever-changing field. So the author wanted to investigate the quality of three different types of text. So an essay, a speech, and an opinion piece. And for the academic essay, the author prompted the GPT-3 with uh, write a short academic essay analyzing Kirisu networks in post-World War II Japan. For the speech, the author prompted the GPT-3 with you are a professor of marketing giving a speech introducing the field to freshman students. Write a transcript of your speech. And then finally, for the opinion piece, the author prompted it with you are Nassim Nicholas Taleb write an opinion piece on risk. And this is where our brains lit up and we got to thinking, wouldn't it be fun if we test it out? So we thought, let's find a topic and prompt ourselves and a GPT service and see if we notice any differences between our writing and the AI generated text. So last weekend, Mirren and I had the opportunity to participate to the Educa event organized by our department and found a meme installation. The meme in the slide particularly caught our attention. So there it was, the idea. Let's create a prompt where we expect an opinion piece on pineapple pizza. So our prompt was, you are an American woman in her 20s living in Italy, which is something both Mirren and I have in common write a three sentence opinion piece on pineapple pizza. So we individually wrote our opinion piece and sub subsequently prompted Genie, which uses GPT. Boom, we had all three texts. And again, our brains lit up by now we were, they were on fire. So we were on a roll and thought, wouldn't it be fun if we'd look into the similarities and differences and see if we're able to catch the AI generated test? And by we, we meant you. So on the screen, you can find three different texts, one written by me, one written by Mirren, and one generated by AI. So we ask you to please read each one carefully and try to decipher which one is AI generated. To do so and share your choice with us, please follow the instructions that Mirren will share in the next slide. So at the bottom of your Zoom page, you should find a features bar. Please click on the feature chat 
And from there, a meeting chat window should appear on your screen. In the next slide, we will share the three texts and we ask you to please type your answer, whether it be one, two, or three, in the type message here box, as you can see on the slide. So please remember to send or enter your message, and you can do so by clicking on the icon that looks like the one represented near number three on our shared screen right now. Okay, so finally, please remember also that the number you type and share with us is your final choice for the text that is AI generated. So we're looking for AI generation right now. All right, so I'm just gonna hold a timer for one minute so that you all can read, put your answers into the chat and then Vivian will write them down for us. Okay, so we have the results. We have a total of three for the first text I believe six, if I'm not mistaken, for the second text, and six, wait, no, five, I think, for the for the third text. All right. So, yeah, so now, so now I'll reveal the mm -hmm. AI generated text. Are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the AI generated text was the first text. So the one that got the least vo votes. Um, and it's the one that we presented on the screen. So we we have proof, we shared the, the chat. And what we noticed, and you probably have too, comparing our text to GPTs, is that the chat used idiomatic expressions. It generated personal opinions that were positive one time out of 10. And the one time is the text that we presented to you today. So it was a positive one, which denotes a learned negativity bias then its text was very close to our text we actually found ourselves asking was this mine <laughs> or was this the chats so when we were creating the slides we had to be very careful to the order and what we were doing so to answer the author's first two research questions it would appear that yes gpt comprehends prompts and yes gpt can generate convincing and unique content so Going back to the author's examples, what did he observe? For the first example, he found that the facts reported were accurate and written in a unique way, so potentially easily mistaken for a student's essay. Thus, some questions and concerns arose, especially revolving around authorship. For the second example, in the center of the screen, he found that AI generation included new ideas and original associations comprising an anecdote. So as for the first example's discussion, the author asks, who is this text to be attributed to? Who gets to trademark these authentic ideas? This today is an important issue even for startups that are using GPT because the chat can provide you with literally anything and everything you need to get started. And not only uh, from general information to business ideas. Finally, for the third example, the author reports colorful language being used, original text where the system also impersonates or personates, depending if we consider it legal or illegal, um, a real person's style. But he noticed semantically repetitive, nonsensical, or self-contradicting sentences. Usually, he noticed that it would happen or would be more evident once every 10 sentences circa. So this led to the need to regenerate a new output until it wasn't so redundant. In the discussion, he asked himself, being the user able to direct or redirect the system in generating a new sentence whenever a new sentence is unsatisfying, does this make the user more worthy of authorship, even if he is not writing the text him or herself? So to wrap up this paper, the author concludes that all three examples pass the plagiarism detection test, but there is a strong need and call to redefine plagiarism and guidelines for using natural language processing artificial intelligence, such as GPT-3. So it is necessary. The, the author states that our community has a medieval concept of plagiarism, citing Sadegi's work of 2019, and that it appears rather inadequate when the others in question 
are a copious number of authors' work combined and paraphrased by 175 billion parameter algorithm. Therefore, um, Mirren and I <laughs> wondered, where do we draw the ethical line? And is AI generated content all bad or evil? So going off of what Vivian just said and the author's conclusion, um, let's think about it for a moment. So if we need to redefine plagiarism, we first have to decipher who the, the author is or the first author is of GPT generated text. So I want to ask you all, who do you think is the first author of a GPT generated text? Is it the researcher who physically typed the prompt into GPT and then interpreted the results? Or is it OpenAI or the specific GPT creator? Or is it perhaps um, the prompt engineer? So this is a third possible first author that today's article did not consider. And just briefly, prompt engineering, for those who don't know, is emerging as a new profession. And it describes this careful formulation of input prompts that will guide AI models in generating desired outputs. So in this way, users can copy and paste pre-designed prompts created by prompt engineers uh, just like you would do with statistical syntax. So again, please take a moment, and this one will go a lot faster, but just to choose who you think is the first author of a GPT-generated text, and then following the key on the slide, like we did last time, cast your vote by typing your chosen number in the chat. Okay, so if all the answers are in, Mirin, I see that we don't have really big mixed results. We actually have almost a unanimous answer, which is answer one. Okay, so the researcher, which I was not expecting, but, but very interesting. So this will tie into a point that I wanted to make too. Um, when we think, if everyone is saying, okay, the researcher, the person who put in the prompt and interpreted a prompt, they're the, the author of what uh, is coming out in GPT generated text, that really ties into what we do when we're using um, statistical softwares, right? So who is the first author, author of the output generated by statistical softwares? Like GPT, we prompt statistical softwares like M plus or R or SPSS to obtain what we need, but we're not actually doing the computations. So how we've really handled this um, so far in academia is that in most publications, researchers do report which statistical software and the version that they used. And it seems like there are not any kind of plagiarism debates about this. So it's interesting that there are plagiarism debates about the output and using the output of GPT and not statistics. And it gives kind of this question of, are we more defined um, by how we write and how we do math? So this is something we can keep in mind uh, later when we hop into the discussion shortly. So just, uh, Kind of to wrap up, on this slide we listed a few critical and current examples of how AI is influencing our community. So the first is wrong detection. This just popped up actually on Instagram the other day and I sent it to Vivian. Um, but we have had wrongfully accused uh, people plagiarizing when in fact they were not plagiarizing by AI. So in this example, there was a high school senior and Turnitin, the AI detection system on Turnitin, picked up on plagiarism through the use of GPT when the student actually didn't use GPT to, to write her text. So in other words, the detection systems are not really reliable and probably because the constant generation of human-like content that is being created by GPT um, is, is keeping ahead of those AI that are meant to actually detect it. A second point uh, is what we call identity borrowing for prompting. So we can see that in the author's third example, and we can also see it in the media today. So there's this recent AI generated heart on my sleeve song that was released, and it used both the voices and writing styles of Drake and the Weeknd to construct an original song. So this is another issue that we have. And then a third point that we found is how AI can actually contribute to open science because we've reported a lot of negative things, but we don't um, want to discount all the ways in which uh, AI can help us in, in academia. So it can help by speeding up the dissemination of research and information. And then it can also 
help uh, with work design. So I mentioned briefly that AI use uh, in work psychology focuses a lot around, oh, what happens if AI replaces humans in the workplace? Well, it's not all bad. It, AI can actually help with task variety and meaningful work by taking care of more of the like laborious, time-intensive tasks that don't require our like human touch, right? So creating bibliographies, helping organize systematic searches for literature review, um, or just simply email writing. So this really allows us as researchers to be able to focus on the parts um, of our work and our job that we're passionate about and help contribute to lower levels of our stress, our work overload, and even our risk of burnout. But of course, as we mentioned kind of before we even started the presentation, you do need to double check AI's work because it's not always um, accurate. And then finally, uh, ChatGPT has been worrying several countries, and the most famous case uh, is Italy, and Vivian actually brought this to my attention. And I bet everybody who has used ChatGPT uh, and lives in Italy has found this out by now. But ChatGPT has been banned in Italy, and the main reason behind the government's decision um, to to ban ChatGPT is the lack of alignment with what they understood are OpenAI's privacy policies and user age regulations. So that means concerning minors that could um, have used or could use ChatGPT. And then uh, not only Italy, but also the Biden administration in the US is also proceeding with weighing in on AI regulations. So less concerned about um, privacy and it's not banned, but they do see the need to uh, impose regulations on the use. So to sum all of this up, AI is a big hot topic with big and concerning implications worth mentioning and discussing, which is exactly what, uh, what we plan to do here today. Okay, perfect. So now we just have our, our takeaway points. And I, I kind of briefly touched on them anyway, but thank you very much for your attention during this presentation. And uh, I'll just briefly go over this and then we'll hop into the discussion. So hopefully we now all have a basic understanding of the differences between weak and strong AI and where GPT fits in. And we touched just the tip of the iceberg on ethical debates of AI and using GPT. We dug deeper into the issue of human versus AI generated text and the need to redefine authorship and plagiarism. And then finally, we just need to keep in mind that there are so many more hot topics about AI and GPT that were not discussed uh, in today's presentation or the paper. And so we just have to keep in mind that the implications of using AI and GPT are complex, multifactorial, and are always changing. Okay. So we've touched on a lot of information in a short time. So let me remind you that we will now have a 30 minute uh, open discussion, which will not be recorded. We want to create a welcoming space for everyone to share their ideas and perspectives. Therefore, we do need your help to make sure that the discussion flows by granting everyone enough time to share. We encourage all participants to keep their contributions concise on topic and respectful of others' opinions. And we will do our best to address as many questions and comments as possible within this time frame. So as always, to participate in the open discussion, please use the, the hand raising icon. And we will call on participants in the order that they raise uh, their hands. So as most of you probably already know, professor and developmental psychologist Jennifer Lansford is visiting DIPSCO from Duke University this week. And to initiate today's discussion, we asked Jennifer to open the floor with her thoughts and input on the topic of open science and GPT. And then we'll also leave a slide up with some critical questions derived from our takeaway points that can be touched upon later in the discussion. So take it away, Jennifer. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mirren and Vivian. That was a terrific presentation. Um, I learned a lot and you did that in a very engaging way with having us vote on the um, pizza texts and things like that. So thank you for all of that. Um, I mean, I think you've, you've really introduced a lot of key points here. And so what I thought I could do is share a little bit about some of the discussions about this technology that have been going on at my university for what that's worth. And um, a little bit of my personal reflections, um, but I really look forward to hearing what everybody else in the group thinks. 
So, you know, at, at my university, we've we've devoted a couple of entire full faculty meetings already to um, chat GPT just this semester. Um, and it's it's created a lot of concerns um, that you've you've identified about plagiarism primarily. Um, but it's really um, leading professors to to rethink um, student writing prompts, for example. Um, I personally am trying hard to think about this new technology in positive terms as a tool that we can use and in finding ways to use it um, adaptively and thinking, um, you know, we we don't, I liked your example of, of the statistical software a lot. And um, I think it does uh, have some similar issues to that. And we no longer, even, even aside from kind of complex statistical software, you know, we no longer expect students to calculate um, difficult math problems by hand. You know, we don't object to the use of calculators in a classroom, for example. And so I'm trying to think of chat GPT as something that can be a tool to enhance student learning or to enhance anybody's learning um, rather than something that we necessarily have to um, work around or restrict. But how can we use that to actually enhance our work? Um, but I tend to be also a slow adopter of technology. And so figuring out how to use chat, chat GPT um, productively is, is tricky, I think, for me and for a lot of other people. Um, so some of the other issues that have come up um, in discussions at my university about this technology are things like, um, you know, if, if your goal is to have students write an essay that would be used, that would be graded and used for academic evaluation purposes, um, and the chat GPT is not, you know, the plagiarism, it, it doesn't, as the article demonstrated, plagiarism detectors are not picking up chat GPT text. Um, also, as you pointed out, there are some GPT technology identifiers now, but those also have flaws, as you identified with the student whose essay was kind of falsely flagged as being generated by AI. So all of these technologies have these limitations. So I think some, some faculty members are going to using um, more in-class writing prompts, kind of rather than having students do writing it on their own and at home and then turn in assignments, kind of having students do more of those kind of writing assignments and prompts in class to try to reduce the use of, of um, AI in these assignments. Um, some have also taken to using prompts that, ref that are about very recent events um, or personal experiences to try to get around some of ChatGPT's um, capabilities. But even with that, I don't know that that's going to be effective. You know, as your pizza example um, indicated, there's there's nothing preventing ChatGPT from making up experiences that make it sound like it's a very personal experience. So even asking students about their own lives, I think, is not um, is not really a workaround for this. Um, and then I think other issues that have been kind of in, introduced to the faculty at my university are concerned about have to do with accuracy. Um, if you're asking for um, for accurate scientific information from chat GPT, um, we've kind of played around with some different prompts that have varied in terms of the accuracy of the information provided. So, um, so if you're thinking about kind of advising people how to use ChatGPT, I think one of the messages would be to do a lot of fact checking. So I think kind of where um, where I'll stop this, you know, my comments and kind of look forward to hearing from others is just if I were to think about how to advise people to use ChatGPT or I, I haven't used it so far in my own work um, and don't know if I would, I tend to, I feel a little bit intimidated by it, um, actually a lot intimidated by it, to be honest, but, um, but I think some of my recommendations would be to use it more as a brainstorming tool to kind of start the writing process, you know, and you could think about if you have, if you're writing a scientific paper, for example, and you're looking for ideas of, you know, um, what could be a hook that you'd include in your introduction and you want to type in your basic research question um, and just get some brainstorming ideas from the technology. But then um, 
make sure that you do really careful fact checking. And um, it seems a bit unclear so far how um, ChatGPT is doing at citing scientific sources um, and whether it's actually you know, kind of accurately portraying some of this information. So if you get an idea from ChatGPT that you want to use in a paper to make sure that you go back to an original source to do fact checking and see if the original source is actually reporting what ChatGPT says it's doing. Um, but maybe as much as possible, think about ChatGPT as being sort of like almost like a like a colleague that you could brainstorm ideas with, but that you're not going to take it as the as the pure truth, I guess. Um, that's my very brief um, kind of thought about maybe ways that we could think about or use this technology, but I really look forward to hearing what others have to say.